You have no friends. I have no friends anymore no because friends. I'm in. The, I'm in the only camp I have found. I can't find this anywhere else. I'm like looking for confirmation bias of people that loved Red Rising, loved Golden Sun, and then Red Morning Star and went, "It's all right. It's, it's fine." Welcome back to another Tudor Ramble episode. I'm Austin. And I'm Richard. This is episode number 73, and we are covering Morningstar. I'm, I gotta tell you, Tickle, Austin. Tickle. Yeah. Energy is not here. I'm not getting your red rising mm. rage, your red rising energy for this <sighs> book. I mean, if you've been watching our previous two episodes, folks, Red Rising, Golden Sun, Golden Sun, I was out of my chair in the intro. I was walking a back and a forth and a back again. There and back and I was basically the hobbit. Unjustifiably, but yes, you were. That is such an asshole move right there, what you just did. That yeah. is, I don't take it back. No, I'm not going to validate your opinions. Fine, but <laughs> you liked Golden Sun. What are you talking okay. <laughs> So if, you, if you're keeping up with this series here, Morning Star is the third book in the Red Rising saga. It's actually the completed trilogy, and there's a continuation afterward. But this, it finishes that series. That, that it first is an trilogy. ending of sorts. It's an ending of sorts. And Rich, you're totally right, though. My voice, it's I'm just not feeling as energetic. Mm. If you could tell by my vibe here. Actually, you know what's missing from this episode mm. is the previous two, Red Rising, Golden Sun. We had Kyle Derrick, the Kyle Derrick, voice of God. You know, he, he was on here saying lines. We don't have him? We don't have him this episode. Why not? I... I just didn't feel it, you know? I was like, I'm gonna, I don't wanna waste this time on a. I was gonna, it's a good, it's not a bad book. It's not a bad book. It's just when we're ranking them, I'm going Golden Sun, Red Rising, then Morning Star. That's all I'm saying. Okay. What are you saying? I, I would go Golden Sun, Morning Star, then Red Rising. Got it. And, and by the way, if you're watching, we're gonna get, we'll tell you when we're getting into spoilers for this book, which, hey, if it's the third book in. You should, you should. Be keeping up by now, at, right? at this point, you clicked on the yeah. third ep third book of a trilogy. I know we we will warn when it's getting into that. But Rich, this is the thing: if you can't tell, I, I my Red Rising was my nine point seven out of ten. Golden Sun, a perfect ten out of ten. As much as you and your loser little corner over there wants to bring off that bad energy, this is what I ask you: this one ask. Yeah. I've never asked anything from you in my life except for twice this morning. <laughs> five times yesterday and thank you for the money so <laughs> all i have to say is this rich hmm. you might have to pick up some of my lethargy today uh it's not my strong suit i know but just fake it for uh, once. i can i can only bring the energy when it's a wheel of time <laughs> uh, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to carry the torch you're, i'll, I'll carry the boats rich here's the thing <laughs> i think i probably like this book more than you you is probably my do. guess well want to find this out? will be an interesting situation to be put in this this will so you want to find out because yeah. it's rating time what's your okay? rating so my spoiler free rating for morningstar is a six out of ten that's low that's for, real low for you for a red now for me i don't know i give i give low ratings but for a red rising book it's absolutely low Based on, you know, I'm coming Golden Sun 10 out of 10. It's a four-point rating drop on my scale. Yeah, I, wow. I really don't see how it drops that far for you. For me, I gave it a 7.7, .7, which is below Golden Sun, but honestly pretty darn close. You know, it's hilarious. Huh. This is the closest our ratings have been with this series. <laughs> and that's, that's the most you've been like, whoa, 6 out of 10. Whoa. Well, no. See, here's the thing. <laughs> it is I, shocking. Yeah. I'm not surprised of the rating. Yeah. A 6 out of 10, I would be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. If that's what you think. But it's the fact that you think Golden Sun and Red Rising are 9.7s and 10s out of yep, 10. Yep, yep, yep. Because the fact for, that you're giving it a six, yeah, that's for, where I'm... For you, you look at the three, the trilogy, and go, oh, they're all pretty much the same. They're they're yeah. all pretty close together. Or sure. Golden Sun being the best, and you still like them enough. For me, it's going like, whoa, so you thought Golden Sun and Morningstar were that, there was that much of a gap. That's the shock. Yes. Okay, I understand, and you know what? You'll probably get some... I, I have no people that support me at this point, because the people that love Golden Sun like I did... Now see this, and they go like, "Okay, screw Austin." You know, it's yeah. No, you have no friends. I have no friends anymore no because friends. I'm in the, I'm in the only camp I found. I can't find this anywhere else. I'm like looking for confirmation bias of people that loved Red Rising, loved Golden Sun, and then Red Morning Star and went, "It's all right. It's it's 
fine. Yeah, most people tend to like Morningstar. Yes. So like good. I'm like, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, and this this is gonna be interesting because you're gonna be the more positive one, I guess. Yeah, in general. And I have some. I definitely have some positives to say, but I will share some of my negativity as well. well. The thing is, you're gonna you're gonna play Richard today. You know how oh, normally I'm gonna play Richard. You know. Okay, how, hold on. <clears throat> Go ahead, speak. I'm but what play. I think <laughs> is that shit will just be obnoxious. <laughs> Let me get my thoughts out there. You ask me a bunch of questions and I tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, spoiler free, can you give the audience a little bit of what you thought about this book? And I'll do the same. Sure. Spoiler free, the reason why I think it is a good conclusion to the series, at least the trilogy, mm -hmm. is it actually ends in a satisfying way, which is quite rare to find. I thought the action and the plot was well put together. Uh, dialogue was just about the same as the other books maybe it's better than red rising he definitely improved by the third book but other than that uh a cut above the rest that you normally read so a good richard approved book yeah yeah you like good it. that's good stuff um so i did not dislike the book i thought it was above average of course but showing my significant difference from golden sun to this obviously my spoiler free review and we'll get specific about this is the promises that I felt were made at the end of Golden Sun and the start of Morningstar. And the promises of this series, both character-wise, plot-wise, and the direction, did not pay off as much as I have wanted, would want it to, based on what I thought I was promised. I guess that's mm. what I would say. And a lot that's a brig umbrella term. I could get specific when we get into it. And want to start getting specific? Let's get right into it. Uh, why not? There's the third book of the series. Yeah, yeah. They know. All right, spoiler warning, Morningstar talk time. You ready? Yeah. Emotional impact, what'd you give that out of 10? I gave that an 8 out of 10. Holy crap. That's great. That's great. That's okay. This May, is. And I give it that high score because, hey, I liked the ending. That makes sense. Ending okay. was satisfying. Just uh, to, give, to give a satisfying ending, it's good. And so I gave it a 5.8 out of 10. It's one of my lower categories. Ooh. So. That, that's a big difference between you and I. Difference. Can you? So you're eight out of ten. You like the ending quite a lot. Is there anything moments in there that built on that emotional impact for you? Individual moments, of course. I liked the beginning with uh, Darrow and the torture scene. I liked uh, the dynamic between him and Severo, and how he's basically having to basically he's clawing back a middle ground. You're such a Red his... Rising stan. You know that. I'm going to just play you this whole time. Sorry. I'm, I'll let you talk eventually. Oh, no. To play me <laughs> is you have to rate something positively and then only talk about it. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's exactly it. <laughs> but yeah, it it's through Red Rising, you start through the three books. You kind of see him go in different directions in leadership and how he would operate as a person, in as a leader. And the third book he takes, he pulls himself back from golden sun and he hits a nice middle ground where he learns to be the destroyer the reaper and also has to build something new yep kind of saw like yeah it's kind of be where it has to go i thought it did pretty well on that interesting and yeah so I, I see that the whole theme of the book being can you build and not just destroy that's what mustang introduces to him as well are Basically. you are you building off only if you're a builder not just a destroyer and and really realizing that there, there has to be a purpose behind the anger, a purpose behind the violence, not just for anger's sake or for mm. violence, which is the whole, uh, the emotional rift between him and Severo, especially for a, a first good half amount, of the book. First, first half of the book, At least quarter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A good amount of the book. And even mm. later on, it, the, even though they follow, you see Dara's friends, like, with a great lust wants to kill the golds and destroy the society where Darrow starts to see, all right, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we may win, but if it's filled with this type of anger and hatred, we're not going to leave much in our wake. Yeah. And so he has to learn to dial that back. Right, so you like Car Darrow's good. character. You like how it ended. Just good things from you. But an eight out of 10 is a, that's a high Richard score. I want to pinpoint, is. is there another, like, is there an emotional bow tie or something else? The action. The, the action, you love the action? The action was really awesome. fun, exciting. The twist kind of got me. The, those got me. I thought Severo was going to die at the end, and they tricked us. 
So I thought that was good. Okay. Got it. And so... Like Ragnar the, dying, was that a big moment for you as well? The big yeah. emotional pull? I thought Ragnar's death was really well handled. I was very surprised by the ending. Kind of going... I was looking at myself like, how the hell are they going to wrap this up? It, like, There's not mm. many chapters left. How is this going to wrap up? Yeah. And like, they don't have enough time. And they did. And I thought it was really well handled. I was thoroughly surprised how quickly they were able to wrap up the uh, the coup. And yet it was still satisfying. I'm milking every moment of this. Just you talking good about a Red Rising book. And yeah. here's the thing. Here's the weird thing. Like You rated some other aspects higher in the other books, but talks more negative. You're always, you're my antithesis. antithesis. Yes. Just You push back. I think it's a good thing. For my character Here's growth. The thing. <laughs> I just generally like being devil's advocate. Yeah, you do. You I do. very much enjoy disagreement. You want to know one it's thing? Great. So you've done many good things for my life. Like, I'll think of them one day. You'll but find them eventually. I'll find, eventually I'll think of something. But yeah. one thing that you've done that's both maniacal, mm-hmm. but also very good, I mm. think. It's a double-edged sword, as you would say. Mm. When I have conversations with you, outside the podcast, mind you, and it's about we some, don't do that. No, no, we don't. We don't. But I have noticed this, and I do this with other friends and strangers now too. Where if mm-hmm. I don't know enough about something, like I will just not have an opinion, because I know I will have a random opinion on something that you know I I read an article headline, and yeah, of course I'm I'm an expert now. And then I'll bring that up with you, and just you know th- not anymore, but just in the past I'll bring it up with you, and you'll have you'll just push back on it constantly. And then all I had was the headline. So I'm like, well, sh- shit, what do I say now? Like, I, didn't, I didn't expect to be questioned. I was looking for a guy to just go, you know, head nod, be like, yeah, Austin, your anger is justified. Hell yeah, brother. And then, and then I'll, and then I walk into this stone wall. I'm like, wait, that's not what I expected. And so you've done for me in my life is I will now approach things and go, I need to listen first and get some, get some facts and have a strong opinion and then come to Richard. So all of our Fair conversations enough. now are like three hours long because it's, <laughs> but anyways. See, I, I take the opposite stance. I'll hold a strong, really you do. well thought out opinion on something I've thought maybe five minutes about. You do a great job, buddy. <laughs> I'll just take a side and I'll defend it as hard as I can until oh, I great. literally can't. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. But That's one, like no, I said, it's a double-edged sword be, because- whether, whether I know what I'm talking about or not, oh, yeah. taking a stance will let me learn. Yes. And that's because if I thing. fail, if I can't defend something I don't really know anything about, I'm going to learn a lot from the other side. You will. Or maybe through the art of discussion and debate, I will formulate a strong uh, argument yes. for it. Even if I don't really know what I'm talking about. You'll probably take the other person's opinion when you go to argue it next time. Yeah, well. exactly. Because you, you fuel Fun. that. And that's the thing. It's a double-edged sword because one... Yeah. I think my opinions through more. I have to, I confront people with, you know, I, I formulated this, but the bad thing is, I, you know, talk to any stranger or something, I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, people don't like that kind of conversation. <laughs> exactly. Okay, we, bad, bad ramble there. Going back to emotional impact. Yeah, why did you give it a six? You gave it a 5.5 out of 10. 5.8, close. 5.8, okay. That's another thing Richard doesn't do. Listen. <laughs> no, it's, you do listen, it's just you can't remember shit. It's just... Look, Names and numbers are not my strong suit. Yeah, yeah, it's that's fair. So I gave it lower on the emotional impact, and we'll get so emotional impact more broad. Get specific with characters and plot because that's where it hit. Mm-hmm. I wrote down these three big issues for me. One was the characters we got. So Darrow, I have big issues with Darrow's character, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in characters. Mustang, Victra, and others. Again, we'll talk in characters, but. What I didn't like as much is I was confused by a bit of Darrow's motivations. I thought that some of the things with Mustang and Darrow were too quickly resolved, which brings me into one of my next big issues, was the consequences from Golden Sun and the consequences from things that happened in this book. Uh, on a personal level, because on a world level, a lot of bad stuff happened. Things were nuked and all this, of course. Yeah. But on a personal level, I felt like some things were time-skipped a bit, and not given the credence or the payoff that they should have brought. And I wasn't emotionally there. And there's several points I'll go through when we get plot and so forth. Um, and I will say as a broad term, the puzzle pieces fit almost too perfectly. And I will say with this comes with aspects in the plot of the plans that were made. 
and especially the big plan at the end was too much of a bow tie for me to believe all that could have gone that well and plus how the plan got there. So things like that and also consequences to Mustang and Daryl's relationship Golden Sun to this. So it's a lot of it had to do with the consequences. I was looking for something bigger, grander. And another big issue for me was some of the pacing. I felt like a lot of the things that were focused on in Morningstar, like for example, you look at Red Rising, Golden, Golden Sun, I thought every chapter was essential. Everything was following what Darrow needed to follow in that moment or what, what Darrow was going through. It didn't get to the fluff. We got right to, okay, we're on the battle. We're, on, you know, we're, we're battling in the Institute from here to here. We're finding the all's lost moment here. Boom, 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 boom. In this book, I found a lot more moments of, this is going to sound very, very, uh, dumb's not the word, just very non-smart. Just, just very, ignorant. very, yeah, ignorant, very pea brain of like, the moments that we're focused on didn't seem like we were following the most exciting moment. And that's why, I mean, it sounds like popcorn pea brain, but what I, what I was used to and expecting... Well, give us an example. So I thought too long we were spent in moments between meeting Quicksilver and after the torture. Do you remember that portion of the book? So after the torture yeah. scene and getting to... Quicksilver and like the what was the point of this book I was waiting to see like what's the direction what's the plan and finally we get to that meeting point with Quicksilver and Mustang and all of them there so like the moments in between when he's back in uh in under not not Lycos but their their base that they created down there it starts with a T I believe I forget forget the exact name but when they're in that base and the scenes in between and even when they're with the obsidians that whole portion of the book where they go to the poles and that you know that's where Ragnar dies and so forth for how much time was spent there, I didn't feel like a lot happened. Yes, they, they got the obsidians on their side, but there were a lot of chapters spent there, and it just wasn't all essential, I didn't think. So the, the dumb thing I was going to say is hmm. the times, it, didn't, it felt like we were always, not always, again, I, I have to be careful because I'm talking to you. So <laughs> it felt like we were looking at the moments that weren't the most enthralling parts that we could have been seeing. I think a lot of this yeah. maybe comes from the theme of the book being reconstruction. Yeah. And it's very easy to be efficient when, like especially in Golden Sun, which is just destruction, win, oh, yeah, win yeah. the battle, win the day. That's it. So you don't need too much of the kind of filler chapters. Where in Morningstar, it's very important for Darrow to have those chapters with the citizens of the Obsidians. To, to actually interact with our culture and yeah. show the damage that the golds impose, like the do the gold society imposed on them, and how do you fix that? How do you fix the societal problems, not just the military problems? When they're on the base on Mars, the underground like secret base, mm -hmm. you need those moments where he's interacting with the seeing the colors and then the high the high and low colors interacting with each other and trying to figure out how to actually get them to work together in the long run because that all this is tiny little moments that are a test for how he will build a better future. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's, it's about building, right? They are they are important, but they're not as immediately important to the plot. Mm -hmm. It's important for the overall message of the book though. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. I think there's, and again, when we get the character plot, I'll pinpoint exactly where I mm -hmm. thought it was bad and good, but to give love to the book, because it's not a sub five, it's not horrible. <laughs> I absolutely love the torture scenes. I thought oh, they were so well written. I love, I still love the Jackal. I think he's one of the best villains. And so as an emotional pull, I, I just wanted to see, I wanted to see the Jackal on screen or on page so bad because he's so evil and so twisted and so interesting. He's so. He, the Jackal is a great villain. I really do like him. Yeah. However, nothing will top the hand cutting scene in the first book. That was a great scene. Think it like ultimately I, I have to like Yeah. It's it's almost a sad little negative. Why? With it. Because you would think like the villain like the ultimate villain would have many more of those type of moments. I just don't remember him or I don't really think of him like he's good he's a good villain but nothing will ever top w when he was in book one do you get what I mean like I, I should be mean. most terrified of him in book three like I should ultimately like he should be 
incredibly imposing in book. Well, three. here's what I'd say. He Basically. didn't have he didn't have that cut handoff moment, but some I'll say a book two moment, a book three moment that just cut, like love the jackal. These moments stand out. A book two moment was very simple, where Ragnar, how we saw this just absolute beast of a man, everyone cowers next to him. There's no one stronger. He's written as the biggest, strongest, best. Boom, Ragnar. And when he's introduced to the jackal, jackal simply doesn't even acknowledge him. He doesn't. He doesn't even acknowledge physical strength that bores him. So something small like that, where uh, so someone that is that ever present and everyone fears, the jackal doesn't even bat an eye and doesn't care. And then something that goes over into book three with the jackal. This I loved is where the jackal started speaking differently and mimicking, copying almost like a robot Darrow's speech patterns. Because Darrow works so well with his speech patterns, the jackal started mimicking it for his own twisted use. That's how much of a conniving villain it is. He's trying to win. He has this obsession with it. And we find out more of that from his backstory with Mustang. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't have the caught offhand badass, you know, holy crap, this guy will do anything. But that's because he's not in the Institute. You know, he's not in that, he's not in that sub, um, what do you call it? The inferior position, like he is in books two and three, because he's building up his power. But yeah, no, it's it's just the moment that I I have not seen topped with him. But fair. we're starting to get hey, into characters. Then let's talk characters. And so because this is where I want to give a lot of my grievances. So I gave it an eight point two five. Eight point two five, really strong again. Jesus. Okay, so I gave it a uh, six point two five. Still, but actually higher than emotional impact for me personally. Yeah, I. I think it's just about in line with the other books. Like, I didn't think there was a significant difference in characters mm -hmm. between books two and three. I think the biggest pull for characters, Jackal, as we were just talking about, everything we just said there, love the Jackal. Fantastic villain. And I really like several of this book. Did you like several? Because you, I did. you mentioned in your emotional well, I, part. I, I liked how he was not just the one note. In books one and two, he kind of is just... Best boy. Best best friend. The best friend character. Not really much flaw there. Not much to really chew on as a character. Mm. But he's, you know, fun. He's fun on the page. But that was it. This third book, there's actually something there. He was actually had to pick up the pieces after Darrow's gone. You see the burdens, burdens of leadership, which further emphasizes why Darrow's a good leader of seeing what his burden looks like on other people and how it weighs on them. And so when he picks it up, it's more impressive. All that. So I liked that stuff with him. I totally agree with you. And there, since you gave you a 2 five, there weren't characters that you didn't like, really. You no. didn't have any... So this, yeah, there's this no, is where we There's have... no characters I particularly disliked. I thought all of okay. them were good. This is where we can have our conversation, then. Okay. Because, well, one thing I'll say before we get into Darrow, because there's going to be a lot to talk on Darrow. Victra being alive, I do Sure, Darrow's, Victor's a fine character, but I thought she had such a perfect ending in Golden Sun. I was really upset to see her alive. Where I, oh man, she had such a perfect ending in Golden Sun that I wanted her to stay in my mind like that. Mm. It makes sense that she's alive, parts of the plot and going forward, but I, I will say that. So there's really no other thing to say than I preferred if she'd stayed dead. But Darrow, let's talk Darrow real quick. Sure. And I want to quote Pierce Brown first. So in his acknowledgments at the end of the book, mm -hmm. he says this, and I think this explains more why Darrow didn't do it for me. So Pierce Brown says, it wasn't until I returned from the cabin, and by the way, the cabin, he went to write at a cabin to finish his story. So it wasn't until I returned from the cabin that the story began to find its voice and I began to understand that Darrow wasn't the focus anymore. It was the people around him. It was his family, his friends, his loves the voices that swarm and hearts that beat in tune with his own. So it's him. And he says this very kind acknowledgement and then thanks the people that helped him make this book. Now I think Pierce Brown, what he was definitely going for as well was Daryl was no longer the main, main focus. Of course, it's still Daryl's story, but he gave more props to people like several that had their moments. Mustang had their moments. So the people around him that made Daryl who he is. So it makes sense, of course, but I almost think I'm not making an accusation, Pierce Brown, of course not, but I think him taking the gas pedal off of Darrow a bit, he almost felt like Darrow's arc was kind of complete. Like he learned his lessons and now this was Darrow using both, you know, learning the vengeance for the first book and this and being the perfect leader. I completely disagree. I think that Darrow's arc was far from over. 
is the problem. Now, this is where I have my first problem with Darrow's character in the story. And I will say, of all the things I could say, emotional impact, everything, the worst part about this book for me was Darrow's character. Like that's how much, you know, I was, I was really disappointed with a lot of what happened. So what happened with Darrow is end of Golden Sun, betrayed by Roke. He's tortured now for a year. He's in the thing like for nine months, right after three months of being so. Already introduced to this lesson he had to learn from the previous book. And I was look, coming into this book asking, okay, who's Darrow's character now? He just got betrayed. How is he's going to have trust issues for the rest of his life? He was tortured into oblivion. What is Darrow going to look like coming out of this? And I was so curious. And I was confused with what he got out of that because I'll, I'll give a couple points here and I want to hear your thoughts because maybe I'm reading too into this as well. But the first thing is trust. Like, what is, How does he trust now? Now that his best, you know, Roke, one of his best friends betrayed us, betrayed him. So in one scene, he says, this is a quote from Darrow. I wish I was, uh, I wish there was some way I could control the variables. But in the time of dark, if the time in darkness taught me anything, it's that the world is larger than my grasp, have to trust others. So he says that line of, if I learned anything from the darkness, I have to trust others because the world's bigger than I thought it was. Which one I'm thinking like, Hmm. So, you know, one thing you learned in darkness after being betrayed by one of your closest friends that you have to trust others. I was questioning that going, that's, that's really strange. Right. But I, well, I get the direction. Part of it was he, he believes that Roke betrayed him specifically because he didn't trust Roke with the truth before. Yes. And that, so he is looking at it. The reason why I Mm -hmm. was betrayed and the reason why I failed is because I didn't trust others sooner. Yes, no, exactly. So that that could be. So I'm looking for the direction. I'm like, okay, that's a direction. That's an interesting way of putting it. I, you know, my knee jerk reaction was being betrayed by one of your best friends. Is now, you know, I'm trust issues with everybody, right? Mm-hmm. But then you have this later talking to Cavax, who was, you know, telling us one of his best buds. Um, and this is what Darrow says. I want to trust him. I want to believe his sense of justice is equal to my love for him. But these are some deep waters, and I know friends can lie just as well as enemies. You know, going here. So you kind of have this back and forth between where in one scene, Darrow is saying, you know, have to trust others, can't do everything yourself. In another scene, you know, being very like, I can't trust Cavax, like I, after my time in darkness. So I'm seeing two Darrows of like, okay, do you have trust issues or don't you have trust issues? Mm-hmm. These two things of where I'm going, okay, I just, I need to grasp on the who Darrow is right now. And I'm not getting that. I was confused on to whether he was very distrusting or whether he learned he has to show more love to his friends so they don't betray him. And he was giving me both of that. Hmm. I think a lot of it was that he personally needs to open up to his friends. Mm-hmm. But then, like, the reason why he felt that he was betrayed is because he did not trust, he did not put his trust in others. And so they didn't put their trust in him. That was kind of his, but now he's on the mentality of for others to put their trust in me, for me to get other people's trust, I have to put my trust in them. So it's, I, I imagine it's kind of like that two way street. He kind of saw uh, Roke's betrayal as his own personal failure. Mm. Not that he chose the wrong friend, not that he trusts the right person. It's that he did not, he did not put on his side, he did not put. He did not trust Roke with the val- the the uh, the important information that he yeah. should have, and so his betrayal was inevitable. And so now he's more okay. I need to be open with myself, but also, you know, still feel out other people. Right, but can you see what I mean by that point? That you know, I think Pierce Brown's trying to make here. Can mm-hmm. you see by my point of after this rageful Red who wants nothing but to kill? You know, he's got this rage in. Go ahead. That, that is where we disagree from books one and yeah. two. I didn't see him as that rageful. Okay, well... But I, I want you to get... Well, like, that's where I'm... Yeah. You're seeing him differently in books one and two, and I saw him differently. So, to me, We're coming at a different three point. was not as much of a... Okay, at least you could say the shift. intent is for him to be rageful. Like the, yes. So his yes. In, his intended character, regardless of you know what we both think, is he's this rageful guy. Rash and rageful. He has this rage, this built up rage in him. Mm -hmm. And after being betrayed by his best friend and then tortured for a year and it's written so freaking well, the torture and that what he has to go through for several chapters and it being that long and him to come out with that kind of very 
thoughtful point of view where I think the Darrow reaction, the Darrow I know, would come out of that torture a bloodhound. I think he would come out with a fury unlike any other. And for him to come and have this middle ground between I have to trust those, but I can't trust, and having this conflicting point of view where I was confused where he was at, I think Daryl would have came out a very different man. Not come out of my, like, being shriveled up, anorexic, having no food, no part of you. For a year, something, something would build up to where, here's, so here's, well, here's, he should have learned that lesson at like the halfway point of yes, the book, so here's not the thing. in he, the beginning. Yeah, he comes out of there, and this is where I disagree with where Prius Brown's direction was, is, you know, Daryl wasn't the focus anymore, it was on the people around him, where I think Daryl had lots to learn, still. Like, he should not have had everything figured out after everything he had to go through from Golden Sun in the intro here. And this is where I think he just has, this is where Daryl, I think, has the wrong lesson taken as well, where I just disagree with Pierce Brown's point of view on this, where Pierce Brown and Daryl see both Roke and Tactus as redeemable. So, several, Darrow sees Tactus as redeemable, where I don't see that Tactus first off tried to rape people, and after that also took Lysander and basically was going to kill everybody by getting, you know, took Lysander out of the ship in Golden Sun I'm talking about, yep. and that could have jeopardized everybody. They, Darrow literally had to go take over a ship to survive and not get blown to shreds because of Tactus's move. But when he was going to be the death of you and rape people, I just did not see him just because he like had the violin lessons at the end or really kept the violin. Didn't see him as redeemable. Same with Roke to make that utter betray betrayal to where you'll be in prison for a year tortured and you will die and makes that ultimate betrayal. Darrow still saw the light in them because of their connection from uh, from the Institute where that I, I thought the lesson would be from Golden Sun. Lorne and Darrow had this debate where Lorne killed Tactus and Darrow said, oh, you shouldn't have done it. And Lorne later in the book then says to Darrow, hey, Darrow, you were actually right about Tactus. I was, you know, you were right about this whole thing. And then the very last chapter of the book changes all that up and shows like, hey, Roke, one of your best friends also just betrayed you. And Lorne's dead. He will never see his grandchildren again. Every, uh, Fish, Fitchner is dead. Nero is dead. Victor, we thought she was dead. We thought she was <laughs> so dead. all these people are dead because you trusted these people. You thought they were redeemable. Guess what, Darrow? Here's a wake-up call. Some people are true evil, Darrow. Now you're getting tortured for a year, Darrow. You are in the mud, Darrow. You will die. You are at their mercy because of these people you trusted. Get angry! So I came out of this looking at Daryl like, oh, he figured he's in his Zen mode now. He like trusts here and trusts there. And I'm seeing all this going, no, Daryl. The lesson wasn't these people are redeemable. They were evil, Daryl. They were evil. And you should have came out of here with trust issues galore. You should have came out of here freaking like a, a, a P PTSD on steroids out there. Like you see a ghost everywhere. Like you flinch back and forth. You don't know when Jackal's there. That's how you should have felt. And... The direction of this story with the character of Daryl, that's what I kind of more expected from... Sorry, I'm spitting into my mind. <laughs> but I'm so... I love Golden Sun so much. I, I wanted so much from this. I, but, I actually yeah. do see your point on it. Yeah, okay. It. I, I want to bring in other examples from different series that do this <laughs> point better. Right, right. Wink, wink. <laughs> like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think people at home know what I'm talking about. Rage of Dragons? <laughs> No, oh, what boy. do I else talk about oh, all the time? Okay, yeah, 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 wheel time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's handled a little better than... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... I understand that... I don't completely disagree with the message that they're trying to ultimately get to, but yeah, you're right, the fact that it's basically solved in the beginning of the book. That's what I mean. Like, Darrow's yeah. character to Pierce Brown was over. Like, not over, but just he, he had his character arcs. I'm going, no, that's the biggest... Ending Golden Sun like that... Darrow has so much to learn now. And the kind of story I had envisioned or where I thought it was going, and this is more plot, so, you know, I'll take the pedal off. Let's, well, let's, let's go talk into more, plot. Well, no, let's talk a couple more characters just to get those oh, out of the way. Okay. Um, I want to say Mustang also had problems with. Um, oh, so okay. I, now, at the same time, I did give characters a 6.25. So again, love Jackal. I thought several was also great. So those definitely raises it. And Daryl, as much as I'm complaining, I, I still saw where it was going. I don't hate Daryl. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, I, I wanted so much more. Mustang was the other problem for me. 
And this is where it came to my previous point on the consequences of what would happen. So the consequences from Golden Sun, Mustang, and Darrow being at odds ends. Now he showed Darrow showed Mustang his red self, his family back home, and Mustang had a perfect reaction to it. How you would expect a gold all her life to react, and creating this great conflict. Coming into Morningstar, the conflict's kind of over. Like, you know, Mustang, it comes up to him, and, and we know why, because they have a child together now, and a lot of time passed. So of, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. It makes sense because they had a child together, Mustang had a lot of time to think. But again, I felt like we missed the tension there that was so gripping from Golden Sun. So Mustang's character makes sense, but wasn't as powerful because I thought... It's one of those moments I would have liked to see resolved and earned, and it wasn't earned. She kind of came to Daryl after that whole Quicksilver meeting and finding out he's alive, etc., and basically said, hey, I want to see if you're a builder, not just a breaker, which great, but they're basically on the same side, and he shows he proves himself in the end, and that's great. If they somehow kept that tension up between them, and there was an earned resolve in their relationship, and there was a payoff to it. I would have loved okay. the character much more. Sorry, I'm rambling. Here's the thing. I thought I thought this episode, I was going to be like, you know what? I'll let Rich talk a little bit. But I, I, I here's the thing. Golden Sun, I love so much. I have... I'm bringing the energy, but I'm bringing the negative energy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay? I'll, I'll totally... You know what it's totally, like to be me. <laughs> I, I, I don't like it. I don't like being you. It's, it's not fun. But anyways, that's my point. I'm Mustang, so... I actually understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I, that makes a lot more sense where... It's just not, maybe you could do both. The whole conflict with her is, it for her to judge, is Darrow a builder, not just a breaker? And that's mostly not just for building a new society, but also her child. She does not want yep. to rate, she is not going to let Darrow near her child, their child, mm -hmm. if that's all he is. If he's just a breaker. Yep. Then he's not good enough to... No, she makes total, total sense, right? Total sense. But it would have been nice to add on top of that a little bit more friction, something something a bit more juicy to dig into their relationship and their conflict. Yeah. I get that. I could be convinced to lower my character score. You could be convinced to lower any score. <laughs> I can never get you to raise your score, but I can get you to lower. <laughs> you can always convince me to lower. I, uh, I will say to... I'm to, always <laughs> willing to just drop that score even further. Yeah, your goal is to get every book at a five. Like, you can't enjoy yeah. books. Who does no, that? No, I just like my tens to be rare. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'll throw out there Aja. I think Aja's a great villain. Uh, you know, she's not a, I would say, antagonist. She's intimidating. Yeah. She's, she's very intimidating, killing Ragnar and then having to have a four-on-one at the end there so an intimidating villain and i love lauren's statement on her of like there's you know never fight a river and never fight aja damn <laughs> okay and i will throw out another character i liked quicksilver oh yeah quicksilver was great yeah i liked a very influential and powerful character that mm -hmm. wasn't a gold yes because at a certain point i don't know about you but it kind of happened with Red Rising makes sense because it is just a mostly the golds doing their thing. Yep. But even into Golden Sun, it's mostly just a gold party. It's like it's all all the characters are golds. You got Orion. Like, you got Ragnar. There's an occasional other color, but then like yep. there's a lot of colors like where they they serve no purpose in any of this conflict. You got Orion. Like the greens. What do the greens really do? The grays. <laughs> do they serve any purpose? Eventually other they than do. Fodder. Yeah. But do you get what I mean? Like, oh, I totally not, get what you mean. Like, yeah. There's this whole spectrum, and you kind of want to see the rest this. of society. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you get a bit more of that in Morningstar, but I would want more. I'm glad Quicksilver was a great addition because it's yeah. an actual important character. Not just like, oh, the blue, because they, they're the only ones that can pilot the ships. Yeah. Like, it's too functional. It's like, that's why they're important. It's not as great where quicksilver is a very important character to mm. the society and powerful more powerful than most golds and so i liked that a lot definitely and it's great to see he, he had that great motivation being an ultra capitalist mm -hmm. and it makes sense why he has the motivation to help the sons of Ares because the golds are literally in the world this is why the world building we can get into later but the world is thwarting and preventing robots and advancements because that's the gold society that they're setting up, is they're hindering technology. And for a capitalist like Quicksilver, of course he wants he wants to make money. 
They're stopping me from making money. <laughs> the most important thing. The most important thing, right? And okay, l- lastly, a couple characters like Sephi, Sephi. The do you remember Sephi? So what do you think about her? Uh, the Obsidian. Or oh, throw, throw Ragnar in there too. Of course. I like just yeah. it, you didn't get enough time with her to really like just like like Ragnar. Right. So she kind of basically replaced Ragnar. Sure. But not as good of a replacement. Yeah. Can't replace Ragnar. Can't do it. All right. Plot time or you want to say anything else on characters? No, it's about. I could be I may actually even lower my score after this because of you. You hear it? You hear that <laughs> you hear that here first? <laughs> All uh, right. Plot, what'd you put that on a 10? I gave it an 8.25. 825. Another great score. Jeez, okay. Yeah. I gave it 5.6. And this was, I think, my lowest... Yeah, plot was my lowest score of the five categories. And 8.25, another high one, does that come off of you like the satisfying ending? Sat- and yeah, the satisfying it, ending yeah. will carry me on a lot of this plot because yep. I, I've read too many series where the, the ending is just not that satisfying. And like that can ruin a lot of stuff. That's the first point you've made this whole saying on Morningstar is as much as I'm like, I still gave it 6 out of 10 okay I don't hate it but as much as I'm being negative it is really hard to finish series and it does it doesn't butcher the series it's not no. it's not bad it, it's very satisfying I, I, the fact that the ending was wrapped up as it is and I thought yeah. it was realistic like I didn't think it was like shoehorned in or like oh that was too quick it, it felt like oh yeah that that seems right uh, the fact that they were able to overthrow the society in basically one book made sense. <laughs> Got and it, it. It didn't feel too super quick or insurmountable. Mm-hmm. I think Pierce Brown does do a great job with that in all, uh, I mean, the previous two books as well, where Red Rising, mm-hmm. where there's like two or three chapters left, and you're going, how, what just, wait how a second, it wrap how is it going to end in two chapters? And then he does it. Or Golden Sun. I mean, more of a middle book. You, you could kind of end anywhere. But still, the last two chapters just flip, 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 whoa, and changes everything. So he does do that where it sneaks up on you and concludes with a bow tie like that, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it, he really does does do a good job at that. But to be negative, Nancy, here, why did I write the plot so low? The ending was one of my issues. I can list off some of my issues, but the ending was one of them. Where... This comes back to the theme of the consequences easily, quote unquote, easily being resolved. Mm. You know, Mustang Darrow, that consequence. I wanted more consequences. Or I wanted more consequences from the torture. I wanted more. Con- so, of course, there's scenes like that I loved, by the way, where Darrow destroyed the rim and made that decision. That, that's, that's that's my. I think that's the best part. Of that's the my entire yeah, book. It's my favorite plot point. So I have no complaints about that. That makes sense with Darrow's character. That. And he, sh- it's a d- very hard decision he has to make. It's great decision. It, yeah. it, one, it makes him an actual interesting protagonist yes. of like, it's war and like, good men have to do t- very awful, terrible things in war. And you see my kind of point in Darrow's character where if he was built up differently from the torture scene, that moment could have been meant even more if it was mm-hmm. even more twisted of like, he's doing it, but not all of him hates it. Mm. You know, a little like lean a bit more into that gray character, and but here's the thing: you'd understand, and that would be part of his character arc that you have to get to. You know, and it, it, that have to resolve eventually. But there could have been more emotion behind that. But somehow, I was feeling when he was destroying the rim that he was still a perfect guy. So yeah, well, so, more of yeah. a like it was a necessary, it, evil. necessary evil type of thing where it could have been more evil if we got a different. Yeah. Different point of view there. But anyways, with with the ending of the series, yes, it does bow tie and everything. The, the biggest complaint I have about the end is the entire plan that Mustang, Cassius, and Darrow make and several make to defeat the society. Um, my one complaint is everything has to go like really swimmingly and perfectly in order to work. And a lot of puzzle pieces have to fit together like to a T, and it does. I'm like, okay. That's that's fine. Um, well, not fine. I was just like everything. <laughs> everything really had to fit smoothly. Like nothing could go wrong. And of course, they had the one odd odd situation that they didn't expect was Cassius had to cut off Darrow's hand. Of course, that that was that threw a little wrench in him, but didn't stop the ultimate goal in the end. So it happened a bit too perfectly there, where everybody was in one room, 
the cameras were on showing it. Like, I could see that Pierce Brown had the very difficult job of having to wrap up the series in three books like he wanted to. So I could see, like, you know, you had to have a moment like that. So, yes, it, it did happen. It did exist. But as a satisfying conclusion, so after all that happened and the dust is settled, I felt, again, this is coming from reading Golden Sun and having that phenomenal twist ending and it being, having these, it's a bit of a darker series where people unexpected die. Things happen, you know? And again, this book does have gravitas work. There are nukes literally launched on Luna and millions die in the end. So I don't mean it's not dark in that sense. I'm talking about as far as the personal, again, consequences go for Darrow, for Mustang and everybody. It was a pretty happy ending. Yeah. I, in general, I kind of thought that that's where it was always going to go. If you would have asked me, you know, after reading book one or book two, if it would just be a very happy ending, I wouldn't think so. Now, that, kind of, that doesn't mean it can't be a happy ending, and it just doesn't... Ultimately, I, it came from the... There are a lot of big external dark darkness like the dark moments comes from kind of unnamed Pete like the millions die nukes. on a nuke yeah and where but it's not that personal darkness right that I I didn't see a ton of personal dark moments between characters in, in this book in it, well no in any of the books really huh not not to the same degree as like real grim dark fantasy no not that stuff like not like you drive a crombie right yeah exactly where it's like no, the darkness comes from the personal, interpersonal stuff where I'm like, ah, I don't know if we're going to get a happy ending in this book. <laughs> I don't think it's really leading that way. Where this one, all the brotherhood and the friendships and that's where the focus is. I kind of always, I did always expect a very good happy ending. Okay, I guess for me, not that I expect one way or the other. I just felt like I was promised a different ending. Not an bad, not an evil ending, but a bittersweet one. Where, you know, the last chapter mm. was kind of him thinking finally of all of his friends, him having a kid, you know, having little packs now, Mustang and him being together, Severus still alive, Cassius and him kind of, you know, they, they part of their ways, of course, but, you know, made, made up in the end with that. So a lot of bow tied things that happen in the end where. I I almost felt like I was promised a bit of a bittersweet, darker edge to it, where the ending I had envisioned mm -hmm. was more like a film, City of God. Um, I, that's probably, I don't know if people have seen that film or anything. I won't spoil that film. But basically, what I was expecting more from Darrow and his story and the ending of this series, at least this trilogy here, was to be a message about hierarchy or a message a, a deeper message of just, hey, democracy and everything's fine. And I get that, hey, I have read on from the books. I get that it gets more into that in Iron Gold and Dark Age. Uh, but I was see I wanted a hint of something darker where, yes, they destroyed the old society, new society is in, but then a kind of look at we, you know, we are now the tyrants or a a yes you know friends are alive here but then you know you kind of have a last chapter or an epilogue or something of the sort where darrow now looks at his bloodied hands as people are chanting hell reaper hell reaper hell reaper beating their chest and it's a bunch of these millions of reds billions of reds saying hell reaper death to golds or something now where they are going to be the genociders where now they are there since they are the head of society but wouldn't you know, that mainly just kind of leave it more of a cliffhanger wouldn't that make it necessary to oh now there has to be a fourth i would say the, a more ambiguous ending maybe where it doesn't have to be as explicit of what i'm saying hmm. but just like you know it's not a cliffhanger to say he has a kid you know okay how's that life with the kid gonna be or you know yeah. packs how's packs gonna grow up so of course yeah. you could have a like you could just leave that off things are gonna be unfinished and go on from there you could also have an unfinished deeper message about society and here's why i think it would be good because the message of the story is what would what would be fulfilled in book three of if you read that last chapter of daryl and them winning and they could still have their victory they could still kill the sovereign but then have a darker couple chapter twist of you know daryl mustang being in the lead 
and starting to rebuild society in some way and Daryl doing the best he can, but seeing what they did, what they changed in the hearts of people and that this revolution wasn't just all kumbaya. And of course, Iron Gold goes into this and so forth. But if we got that in Morningstar, if we got that chapter or two, that's something that showed you now became the tyrants you were so focused on taking over and getting rid of. And now what are you going to do about it? And that kind of existential fear of what he's become mm. would have been more interesting and compelling. Whereas the happy ending, that's fine. And I get that he wanted to conclude it in that point. I don't dislike it. I just... I think I it would have been better. I, I think a, there's a better story in here. I think there's a much better story in here where, one, you take Darrow on a very different character journey and arc, and he he is... It, I've already explained that portion. It's, and, it's the point. I, I do agree with you. The, it, yeah. the fact that his... I don't disagree where his character ended up. I can definitely... Mm. Now, you may say that you want his character to end up a different way, That, but I think we could both agree that his character arc was ended really quickly in the beginning of the book. Yes. And that kind of leads to all the other potential issues with the story. Exactly. That's that's where the issues come up for me, is that that issue with Darrow kind of bleeds into the issues about things being quickly resolved here and there, and the ending being too bow-tied in for me to enjoy, where, man, I... I really was looking for something because that's why Golden Sun so wowed me. You know, you got, went from Red Rising, you know, your Hunger Games doesn't doesn't change anything, doesn't wow you with like, whoa, different type now, of... Now, here's a question. Yeah. Does Morningstar make you think less of Golden Sun? Here's the one thing I'll have to look back at when I finish all of the series mm-hmm. is since I... And I knew this going into Golden Sun that I, I was probably wrong. I said, I said this during our review, actually, that this is how I'm taking this book about Lorne and, uh, and Darrow's message there about redeemability. And I knew I was taking, like, this is what I got from it. And clearly, Pierce Brown clarified in Morningstar, that's not the message. Yeah. So now me looking at Golden Sun, because the message isn't stated in Golden Sun because it finishes on that moment of the betrayal. We get the clarification of what the message is in Morningstar. So does that change Golden Sun and what I think about it? That's essentially yeah. it. So I have to think about this in two ways. One, do I uh, do I honor what I got from it? Or two, do I look at what the author did in his next book and does that change my point of view of the previous? I don't know. I got to think. There, there's no... There's no wrong answer to that. And no, there isn't. I just got to think that over. Like, I'm, I'm going to look back months from now and go like, does Golden Sun still sit the same? And that'll be my answer. Mm-hmm. So right now it's too soon. Fair enough. So, that, yeah. Uh, going on with plot, I want you to say something. Something you loved or didn't love because we're, we're harping too much on the points that I had problems with. <laughs> Overall, I did really like the plot. Okay. I liked the moment. So the whole idea of this being Dara learning how to be a builder, not just a breaker. And so all the different scenes of him with the colors on Mars, the hidden base, I liked all that. I loved so some of the, my favorite kind of plot points was seeing Ragnar with uh, the children. Oh, yeah, that was cute. That was great. That was great. And yeah. not only was it cute, but it, I think it was also most important because to see, it, it's the glimmer of hope that if, can, if the most intimidating obsidian yeah. The most intimidating figure yeah. in the story is also loved by children. I think that one shows that this society in particular is not only genetically engineered, but also socially engineered, and that there is actually a hope for a more egalitarian society. That these strict classes don't need to be this way. And, uh, yeah. So... Of those type, those type of moments, of course, we talked about. I think my favorite moment where Darrow actually destroys the docks. I agree with you. The ports. Yeah. That I think that was probably my favorite. The twists and turns got me. So plot wise, I got very, very minimal negative things to say about it. I will say on the twists and turns. Sorry to turn this a little negative again. Mm. Where when Cassius, they, they had that whole thing with the plan at the end. Cassius shoots several and all that happens, I knew immediately that was the plan. Like I, I wasn't surprised at all, so I was just waiting for the reveal to happen because mm. there's no other way that could have gone where, you know, Mustang, previous chapter or two, says, hey, I have a plan to put together. Well, and that, here's yeah. the thing. Maybe I was fooled because I remember reading the book and going, wait a minute. 
is this like at that like right around that moment going this is the third book of the trilogy right yeah and then i looked up online it's like oh there's a fourth and fifth book yeah oh i was wrong this isn't a trilogy it continues on so i didn't know it was the ending uh, and so i was okay. like oh man severo's dead oh right. my god right we're gonna have golden sun part two <laughs> <laughs> you're ready for it i was ready for it and then uh, they you know of course yes so I, I was tricked i tricked myself okay into thinking. <laughs> but but knowing that seeing the previous scene where severo saved cassius from getting hung Mm-hmm. And knowing that Cassius was now now leaning toward their side and part of the plan, so I, I I saw it coming. And you're usually better at seeing things coming, so you tricked yourself into that one, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I I saw Cassius is betraying him. Yeah, I saw that as completely possible. Fair enough. And there was a smidge, a smidge of hope in me that was like, hey, you can't trust Tactus, you can't trust Roke. <laughs> Cassius is the third one. Again, you got fooled, Daryl. You know? So there's a little a little bit of me. But yeah, uh, so that that's how I felt toward the end. I will say as well, an issue that just I want to bring up because I brought, it was one of my complaints about the first book, Red Rising, was Cassius stabbing Darrow and leaving him there to die. Like, you know... Pre- probably should finish him off there cut off the hand but don't actually kill him exactly so something like that where um no in the plot armor for this one where the battle between roke and darrow ensued and there was a moment where roke and all of his ships that had two options they could have you know destroyed darrow put him into space obliterated him or send leech craft because they they have this obsession now with getting darrow um alive so that they can show him die in front of everybody that type of thing but when you're this far into the war, and I guess Roke has the chance to just destroy a ship, like, you should just end it. Like, Daryl yeah. was betting on the gamble that they would send leech craft because they want to get him alive. And it's just one step too far of, okay, if you're the enemy at this point of view and you haven't been able to get Daryl, he just... And this is, mind you, after escaping torture, this is what the emphasis on it. I could see it once, like, hey, you you got Daryl in a spot where you have him captured. You're getting him, You're finding out how he became a red. Uh, how he went from red to gold, sorry, and torturing him and doing this and then giving off to the Sovereign to investigate. So I can get that. But after having him in your clutches for a year and then Roke having the chance to destroy Darrow forever, but sending the Leechcraft instead was a stretch too far. So to me, I was thinking that most of that was the society's balancing scale of yeah. what is Darrow worth? Mm-hmm. Mainly, is he more of a? Is he worth more to the rebellion as a tactical leader and mm. fighter, or is he worth more as the symbol and martyr? Yeah, because ultimately, that's the risk. Is yep. the rebellion isn't just Darrow? It's all the reds, all the colors. Like yep. the whole society is rebelling. If they just kill him off, rebellion still goes on, and so they they have to take that. They have to look at that risk of like. If we capture him, we can maybe actually force this rebellion back underground. But if we kill him, we make him a martyr, and rebellion still happens. Mm. And so I think that's more of the gamble. You're totally right. You're, you're totally right. I think that I think the gamble should very obviously be on the side to destroy him as a tactical leader at this point. Yeah. That's that's where I don't believe it because at the point of you had him tortured for you, like you had him under your grasps. And you let him go again. You saw what just happened. He like sons of Aries. They were on the losing it. They were about to be obliterated. We saw the state of several. He was not able to lead in Darrow's absence. Everything was over. Darrow comes back and literally flips it in a one eighty for all of it. So you should just kill Darrow. <laughs> uh, okay. Anything else on plot? No. No. You know, whenever I ask that, you you never have any. <laughs> You're, we just no. talked about it the entire time. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Uh, we love, I've, no, I've been sharing my opinion. No, you, you know, you've been you've been fine. <laughs> All right. Dialogue pros. Would you rate it out of ten? A six point five. I gave a six one. Yeah, that's about the same as the others. Maybe a little bit better. I think it's the worst in pros so far. I love I love Pierce Brown's pros. I think I think it's genius, I, I, but. Here's the thing. Yeah. I don't see how there's that much of a difference between the pros of this one and Golden Sun. So here's some of the bad points, I'd say, of why this was lower quality, certainly, than Golden Sun and Red Rising. Um, the first line I'll bring up, let me find this down here. 
Um, okay, yeah, the first thing is there were a lot of uh, Marvel moments. <laughs> it, sorry if I, you know, trash a Marvel, but there were a lot of those Marvel moments of one, I will say, let me find the exact line. I don't have the exact line, but... <laughs> uh, oh, here, here's what it was. It was a moment where... Uh, Daryl, I can't find the exact context. I hate myself. Okay, it was where Daryl actually had to say bye, bye, Felicia, is like one of those things. You remember that in the book? I want to find the exact line because it. Oh yeah, did he literally say Look, bye, Felicia? Yeah, it was Daryl. Or so, so there was a bye, Felicia moment where it was just such a Marvel, like cringy moment. I went, oh, that was that was that's pretty uh, cringe. It was really it, it stuck out to me so much that I just here's the thing. Yeah, Golden Sun and Red Rising also had some pretty cringe. They moments. don't have those by Felicia moments. They have F- find me one because that was <laughs> that was rough. And he- here's some other lines. So with Golden Sun and Red Rising, I loved the speeches. I loved the prose. I loved the action. I thought it was fantastic. With Morningstar, there were enough points where I had to write down like, oh, that line was rough. And maybe that happened more often because my emotion wasn't as there. So for example, you have this cliche line where Darrow says. Or someone says, you know, feels like the end of the world. No. I shake my head. It's the beginning of a new one. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that's, that's all of Pierce. That is Pierce Brown. That's no, what, that one's unique to Morningstar. No, Star. it isn't. I think it is. No, it is not. That That is literally. Show me the receipts. I bet you could have that same line in Golden Sun and also Red Rising. Not that line. Because it's. <laughs> now he's searching. I'm just, no, I you can, search while I do this. No, All right. I bet I can pull to a random okay, page. Okay, let's do it. Random Okay, page. wait, let me name this the page number. Uh, okay, I'll name the page number. All right. Then. A random one. Okay, page 182. 182. Find a cringy line on page 182 of Golden Sun. This is a fun game. All right. We'll have a little fun here. I can't wait. And wait, read the first line that you see. All right, so the first line on page 182. We're jammed. Can't even broadcast. Mustang reminds him. We're going to die. We all know it. Augustus doesn't panic or surrender resolve. I don't know how I thought he'd handle death. Maybe I hope he would wail about and turn pale. Give me the book. Give, give I, I don't book. know. Like, no, no, give me the book. It's fine. Give me, goddamn, like, give me the book. Is that, that cringe? Give, give, me, give, like, give me the give me, give, give me the book. Now, reader, here's... Here's how you know the media is lying to you, okay? That's, so, this is how you know you're this, being this, fed this, fake. This news. is how you know because you notice how Richard read that. Now, watch this from a different point of view. We're jammed. Can't even broadcast. Mustang reminds him, "We're going to die. We all know it." Augustus doesn't panic or surrender resolve. I don't know how I thought he'd handle death. Maybe I hoped he would wail about and turn pale. But for all his faults, he is stalwart. After a moment. He sets a bony hand on Mustang's shoulder. She flinches, surprised. Now, the only difference there was, you know how you read it, Richard? We're jammed. Can't even broadcast. Mustang reminds him we're going to die. We all know it. Now, of course, if you speak like a freaking weirdo, it's going to sound bad. It sounds, oh, let me pull to a random line the exact and talk way. like a maniac. Get out of here it sounds the exact same as your other line no it doesn't they're the same <laughs> now the only difference is your emotional connection to these books you're probably right but so what it's the my- writing is no different it's the same right you're telling me you're author, telling me by felicia writing. is the same in golden sun or a line like this now here's a couple other things i did notice with morningstar that was different he was using a lot more references like there was a line from Cassius that said, we'll always have Luna, just like Casablanca will always have yeah. Paris. And notice how I put that inflection in my voice to make it sound worse. I was doing the same tactic. Uh, but that, uh, to be fair, that line was when they were trying to ruse um, Antonia to get yeah. her to believe. But then there was the this, was the, this was the most blatant one to me where I had to give more points off, where Victor was repeating to Darrow, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. N- n- unironically. Uh, like, as a portion to... Like, this was an unironic scene to help Darrow out. And I'm like, okay, it's goodwill hunting. Like, you can't just do that. <laughs> so, there were those scenes where, you know, ref- Casablanca, goodwill hunting, or the by Felicia, or the cliche, you know, feels like the end of the world. No, it's the beginning of a new one. And then... So, there were enough of those lines, and I have a couple other ones I won't bother scorching over, but there, were, there was enough that I had to pause and go, eh. So... It's very I, subjective. I don't, see, I don't see much of a difference. Like most of like the speeches and monologues are 
kind of cringy in the other books. In Golden Sun and Red Rising, the speeches were phenomenal for me. In this book, in Morningstar, I forget, I, I can't even remember the speech because it was less inspiring for me. I think it was before they were battling with Roke. It, mm. it wasn't as inspiring. It wasn't as, the, the momentum wasn't there. And again, like you said, it's probably tied with my emotion. That's fine. So Yeah. No, I, I, I just don't, other than the, yeah, I think there's probably more movie references to this in this one which is a little strange okay he's having okay. fun with it but- the moment you have by felicia that's three points deducted come on <laughs> you can't just say that seriously in a book you can fit it in there it's fun <laughs> all right what's your the last category is world building world building magic what'd you system. give it 6.25 i gave it a 7.5 okay Good word for you, yeah. Well, especially exploring the Outer Rim was great. We got more of the colors yep. and their actual importance to the whole world instead of just like basically the golds do everything and they're the most, they're actually full characters. And yeah. then, hey, look, it's blues. They pilot stuff. <laughs> hey, look, the greys, they're soldiers. That's about it. <laughs> like, they're all, all the other colors are one note and it, kind of gives justification of why there's such a hierarchy it's like well they kind of are all pilots <laughs> like they they all act the same <laughs> I'm, like i'm sorry the magic system made like the racism between the colors is not like completely fictional and then it makes <laughs> it's like <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it makes me feel racist. It's like if you've created a fantasy world where every Indian was a cornerstone shop owner. Just, yeah. It's like, okay, come on. There, has, right. there has to be one Indian There's that be like, something. wanted to be an artist, right? Like in the real world. But yeah, yeah. really, every single one's on the corner. <laughs> just That's exactly it. I was, I was like... Come on, please, Pierce Brown, prove the gold's wrong. Come on, there's one blue who was like an inspiring artist who wanted to write a book. Right? Yeah, or like really ripped for some reason. It's really just a like fighting. Blue. I don't know. He, he got really into some motivation. He he had a bad breakup, <laughs> yeah. and his blue just got jacked. And so, but no, all of them are. Pi- <laughs> yeah, no, it's just more and more justification of like. Oh, the hierarchy, like... That's funny. It's kind of right. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, but the in this book, we got more of that. With I, Quicksilver and the others, and you start to see the... How the, the high colors... The, you see the genetic differences, but it's not universal. There are exceptions. Yeah, and of course, the world-building reason for all this is that everyone... The classes, the races are... They're genetically different. Well, so... D- genetic differences yeah. plus societal uh, yeah, boxes. I mean, yeah. Pinks are literally formed to be uh, to to be filled with what well, was the violets as well to where they're concocted for not just pleasure but the violet. What was different about the violets, or was that in Iron Gold? There was something really interesting there. Um, oh shoot! No, basically that they're supposed to be men. You're not supposed <sighs> to understand them. It's not just physical beauty. It's something of golds can't understand them mentally because okay. it makes them intriguing okay basically yes. little flaws yes, and little, yes. like, uh, they they engineered them to be less of themselves which is yeah man man so there there is that point with the world building and i will say the reason i didn't rate this as high as i did for the other ones is the amount of time that was spent in certain places in the world i wasn't as intrigued as i should have been for example mm-hmm. the the poles with the obsidians in their world a lot of time was focused there when we got there and about their culture, just, you know, dabbling in a bit with Sephi the Quiet and so forth and the the golds lying to them. That was all interesting. But for how long that was spent there, I wasn't wowed. It's yeah. fine. And I liked, they had the carnivore, they had the cannibals there. They had things like that. Just, um, I, I, I when I'm rating things, I, I, you know this, I don't know if the audience knows this as well, but I put a lot of it with the intent and how much is focused on it and how much I got out. So, just with how much was focused on it, it was good. It was fine. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so, Red Rising Trilogy. Uh, we, we had... This yeah. has been a, a roller coaster where there were high moments, like Golden Sun, and there were low moments, like, like Red Rising. The, no, the first book for you was a low moment. 
That was yeah. I can't believe you on that. That's it's it, such a phenomenal book. It, it's 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 good. I just rate, like this book. Wait a second. It's good. I rated Morningstar lower than you rated the first book of Red Rising. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was wow. a aggressively okay with this series. Like. Jeez. It's good. I liked it. How the teeter is tottered. <laughs> wow. God, you're trying to make that a thing. It Stop is a thing. To make our, it a thing. Our fans know that's no, a thing. No, it's not a thing. Okay, you guys know it's a thing, right? <laughs> I've seen it commented several times by the truest fans. They say, teeter my totter. It's my thing. Ugh. We're going to get it on a t-shirt, and it's going to be like, right here. <laughs> Just a little teeter my totter. Well, yeah, wow. I think we could do that. And then yeah, your, your sayings, you have plenty of sayings, like, I hate my life. Please. Please end it. Please end. No, no, I was gonna say, please end the podcast. Get me a new co-host. That's another one of the things you love uh, to say. Yes, yes. You say a lot of things like that. Uh, you, the thing is, you don't just say it on camera. My, off camera. my opinions are fact. Yes. Yep. yep. Yeah. But the, no, the, the, it's a serious problem. Like this isn't a character. Like after this is done recording, you'll still yeah. say like, yeah, this. I don't. Th- this ain't working. No. We need a new. I need a new co-host. <laughs> Find your replacement by next party. A- exactly. So, all right. We're going to have Iron Gold and Dark Age, of course, eventually. We will record those episodes. We're not stopping there. I will say the... We probably won't release it next No, not next week. week. Because we'll, we'll try and do some other books and other things in between. Yeah, we'll have some fun stuff. I want I want to say this last note from my point of view, even though I gave this a 6 out of 10. Very excited to continue the series from here on out. And I'm not giving up on it. I'm excited for the Lightbringer release. We'll see. All right. So, any, any last words for you? Hey, if you sat through this entire episode... That means you probably like our stuff. If you happen to like our stuff, why don't you think about supporting us on Patreon in the link down below? Give our whole channel a subscribe and like and all that stuff. And thank you all for 10,000 subscribers. You freaking robot. Look at you and plugging stuff and trying to make money. Trying to get that You're Quicksilver, money. aren't you? You're just that capitalist. He was my favorite. Great character. Great yeah. character. All right, I'm thanks for watching, everybody. Money-grubbing capitalist. <laughs> I'm going to end it with that, zoom in on you. Just, hmm. We, no, no, no. You, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to send you the okay. meme to end it okay, on. Okay, okay, end it on this. You're, you're going to end it right on. There we go. <laughs> what, just a look no, at you're, me? No, you're going to cut to this meme. Of what? I was talking like this? No, I'm gonna send you a meme. Oh. You're gonna you're gonna do a sudden jump cut from somewhere in that end yeah. part, and you're gonna end it with this meme. With this meme. Yes. Okay, now if you guys are still listening to this, this means I didn't listen to Richard. I just ended it now. <laughs> Alright, goodbye everybody. Bye. <laughs>